All right, so welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Hunter Peterson. I'm a naturopathic physician. I'm the clinic director of Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. And this is the open forum that is a monthly series our clinic offers to chat about fun health topics that us as doctors here at our clinic are really excited about. Um, and this is my quarterly class now. I used to do them every month in person, and now it's every three months virtually. So I'm still glad to get to do this, um, share with friends about it who aren't members of the clinic if they wanna learn about naturopathic medicine and our approach. Um, and also know that in recording this lecture, it will end up um, on our website, which you can go review yourself or again, share about with other folks. And so, um, yeah, just wanted to kind of use those couple of disclaimers um, to get us started. Okie doke. So right now I am going to launch into the topic I came prepared to talk about, which is food allergies and intolerances. Um, so I guess the place that I would like to begin with this is to really kind of mm, talk about the systems in the body that are most relatable to this conversation about food allergies and intolerances. So I hope it feels logical that I'm gonna talk about the digestive system um, and how that operates in our body because when we get to talking about issues with how our body responds to foods, we have to know quite a bit about how the digestive system works. Um, and I think what I'll be sharing, like not to be um, judgmental, but I honestly don't think that a lot of medical providers understand or put energy into, you know, engaging with these concepts about how our digestive systems really work. Mm -hmm. And consequently, the tools that are used and the strategies given are very disappointing and insufficient a lot of times. So I'll just go out there and say that naturopathic physicians generally are kind of pride themselves in being the gut doctors or the poop doctors or whatever we want to call that, the food doctors, right? Um, experts in nutrition. So just as a profession, that is, you know, a very major part of our training. And it also is um, something quite prominent in my passion area and clinical practice. So um, yeah, that's what we get to talk a little more about today. And it relates to so, so much about our generalized health. And I'll kind of illustrate how food allergies and intolerances end up affecting systemic health um, and why it's such an important thing for all of us, every, every person I work with to be attentive to this facet of their their health because it's so wide sweeping in how it affects all other parts of health. <clears throat> um, so the digestive system, I'll just briefly run through what it is. Um, I actually could, <laughs> I could share a little picture here so you guys can all see that. Um, sorry for being unprepared, um, but I will quickly pull out um, my detox handout, which is um, right in here. Okay, so um, I do a little share screen. Um, can give you my program guide, but why I'm pulling this up is because um, there's a little picture of the digestive system. I just wanna run you through it um, that I have here. Here it is. And we're gonna talk about like what happens to food when we put it in our mouth and it comes out the other end. <clears throat> so we start in our mouth 
we take a bite of, say it's a, uh, let's just say it's a um, handful of almonds because almonds have carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and fats all in them. <clears throat> so we start chewing on it. There's um, all the saliva that helps coat it. In the saliva is all of this enzyme called amylase that actually starts to break down our carbohydrates um, in our mouth. And then as we chew it into very small pieces, we're also increasing the surface area of the food so that it's easier to digest lower in the process. And then we swallow it, which is a voluntary action. And we choose to swallow and then it goes down in the esophagus, which is an involuntary process from there on out. So everything from the esophagus then down to the anus when we actually go have a poop is all involuntary muscles guiding that process. And something really important to remember is when something is involuntary, that means that our nervous system is in control of that process um, external to our kind of mental, you know, energies, kind of. So basically, so, and a little bit of an aside is there's two aspects to our nervous system tone um, that's involuntary. It's called autonomic nervous system. And then there's the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the fight or flight reflex to flight or fly when, or fight when we are in a dangerous, hostile, stressful, fearful environment. Um, that diverts all the resources of our system away from our digestion, away from our reproduction, away from our immune system, and reroutes resources to our brain and our peripheral muscles um, and our heart. Whereas when we are in a rest and digest state, a parasympathetic state, when we're relaxed, when we're under no threat, when we're, you know, um, recreating, um, we are in this mode that really puts a lot more neurological and blood flow resources to our digestion, to our reproductive system, to our immune system. Um, sleeping is very much a parasympathetic phenomenon. Um, and so this routing of resources that the mind ultimately is control over, but it's like an involuntary response at the tissue level, that is a big deal in digestive health as it is in all aspects of our health. And a lot of issues that come up with the digestive function have to do with really poor tone to the parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system and an overactivated, chronically overactivated tone to the sympathetic or fight or flight aspect to our nervous system where that's chronically activated, which is in our modern culture and society, tragically commonplace and almost universal in my experience. So I would argue that for that reason alone, almost all of us have some degree of compromised digestion simply from that fact. And that's not even getting into food, right? That's just how our nervous system and brain are perceiving our environment. Um, and I've had other lectures talking more in depth about that. I go into a lot of strategies in those lectures um, and how to work on that. Um, but it's really good to acknowledge when you're talking about fixing your digestion, quote unquote, that <laughs> you cannot avoid um, you know, understanding individually that aspect of the health process. <clears throat> so um, let's keep going on the digestive lining. So we're in the involuntary part now. At the bottom of the esophagus, a little sphincter opens and the food drops into the stomach. In the stomach, those almonds get all of the proteins snipped apart by pepsin and hydrochloric acid. The stomach has a very, very acid environment, which is really good for a couple of reasons. One, it helps break down all of that, you know, kind of complex food in the ways I just mentioned. And secondarily, it kills things that have come in with your food, like all the bad bugs that might be hanging out on your food um, or that is in your water or what have you that you're swallowing and putting into your system. So it's a very like good gatekeeper for killing bad things that you don't want to end up in your bloodstream. Then that's, that takes about an hour for food to process through the stomach. Then it drops out of the stomach into the small intestine, which is this like brain-like wound up 
coil. Um, small intestine is actually the main organ part of the digestive system we'll focus the most on today. It is primarily, first and foremost, the main absorptive surface, absorption surface of the digestive system. So almost all of our nutrients, vitamins, minerals, water get absorbed in the small intestine. There's a big surface area it has. It's like the surface area is like the size of a football field when you spread it all out because of these microvilli that live there that you know, help increase the absorptive surface. And in that small intestine is also where the food gets snipped up, all the fats, all the carbohydrates and the proteins get snipped up into the smallest possible particles so they can get transported and absorbed into the lymphatic and bloodstream and then go get sent around to you know, keep building and repairing the body. Um, in order for that to happen, we need a few helpers. So we have the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas, which are supportive organs that are accessory organs to digestion. They also have other purposes, but we'll focus on their digestive roles. The liver is where we make bile. Bile is both a way for us to dump out toxins that the liver's detoxified, as well as a way to emulsify or kind of surround the fat that we're taking in our diet so we can absorb it. So that kind of has that dual purpose. And the gallbladder is where the liver dumps the bile to where it's stored so that the gallbladder is basically just a storage tank that when we have a lot of signals after a meal, squirts a bunch of bile out into the digestive tract and um, helps that fat absorption. The pancreas is kind of tucked in behind. It's like yellowish in this picture. Um, it is the organ that secretes a lot of enzymes into the small intestine to actually chop up those carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in their smallest sizes so that they can again be absorbed into the bloodstream. Now there's another, I would almost call it accessory organ that exists largely in the small intestine, especially in the large intestine, which is, we'll get to in a sec, which is an organ I call the microbiome. This is a big, giant, complex web of microorganisms that are part of us that live in co-harmony and coexistence with us. And again, live primarily in the large intestine, but also to some degree in the small intestine and even the stomach and all the way through the intestinal lining, on our skin, um, in our ears, they're everywhere, right? They're just invisible. So we don't know they're there um, in terms of visually, but they play a crucial and like necessary for life to exist role in our health. Because those microorganisms are heavily involved in, and when I say microorganisms, let me be clear, I'm talking about bacteria, viruses, fungus, and parasites. Um, but primarily the biggest constituent in our guts are bacteria actually, okay? And so that bacteria in a healthy environment both helps digest our food. It helps create, um, actually um, synthesize vitamins for us to absorb. It actually takes in the digesting of the food process and makes compounds that are medicinal and fueling to all of the, the, the tissues of the gut to keep them healthy. And it also creates a protective membrane so that pathogens and toxins don't seep into our bloodstream. Um, that, so that is immensely important in terms of its role. Systemically, there's another big thing these gut microorganisms do which is that they have this constant crosstalk going with our immune system. Our immune system is housed all throughout our body, but actually 60% of the immune tissue is associated with the gut. So constantly these immune tissues and cells are sampling what's happening in the gut and they're interfacing with the microbes in the gut and they're actually building the vitality and intelligence of the whole system's immune system immune function based off of that interrelationship with the gut microbiome. So very big deal to understand that facet of things. Um, 
Now I mentioned the microbes. Um, let, let's finish the digestive tract and then we're gonna go back to the microbes. So food spends about three to six hours in the small intestine as all this absorption is happening. And then it goes through the three sections of that, which are called the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And then it goes through the ileal cecal valve or sphincter into the large intestine, which is this green organ in this picture that has an ascending, transverse, and descending part, which is also known as the colon, um, the large intestine. And this is where a lot of bacteria live, like three to five pounds of it in our bodies. Um, so lots of bacteria, like more bacteria than there are cells in our body, in our colon, tenfold more, so like a crazy amount. There is where further um, fermentation happens by those microorganisms of our food, our remaining food. We can break down some of the fiber into other um, nutrients that can be used by the tissues of the colon as well as the body. We can extract some more vitamins synth synthesized there. Um, and we also dry out the remaining water in the colon. And then everything ends up down in the rectum where we return to our voluntary muscles when we choose to have a bowel movement. And we're, you know, pooping anywhere from one to three times a day. And theoretically with healthy digestion, it takes another 18 to 24 hours for food to pass through the large intestine. So it's the slowest there. And a healthy transit is anywhere from um, 18 to 36 hours of, of food moving through our system. Okay. So that was a big crash course run through of something I usually in the detox take a lot more time to explain, but hopefully that was helpful to everybody. And it's really important to set the stage for this food allergy, food intolerance conversation. Um, so um, what I wanna talk about before we dive into that specific topic is I wanna mention what happens when problems start in the gut. So for example, what happens when we're really stressed, um, or what happens when, you know, the system really gets off for various reasons. Um, well, what, so say a lot of stress happens and the blood flow and nerve supply really gets knocked out to the gut, or you're taking a bunch of antibiotics or a bunch of steroids, or um, you're taking, mm, let's see what other would be big precipitating events. You um, have a big parasite infection where a bunch of bugs get in your gut or like bacterial infection where things, you know, like you get a really nasty pathogen and toxin into your gut. Or what if you just are chronically eating foods that are really hostile and poorly digested, the what all ends up happening in the gut lining? <clears throat> so there's a few scenarios I know I just laid out, and we're going to circle back to focusing more on the food part of it, right, today. But the point that I want to make is that things start to change from that really healthy function of the gut I just described to an unhealthy function. And what that can look like is you start to get an inappropriate balance of microorganisms. <clears throat> and this is where we differentiate between the beneficial organisms, which are the, the ones that really keep the gut healthy. Then we have what are called opportunistic organisms, which are usually there in small amounts in a healthy gut, but can get really overgrown in an unhealthy gut and take over the like kind of terrain. And then we have outright pathogens. Um, so when you start to get a lot of those opportunistic organisms or even pathogens really growing, growing robustly, they stop nurturing the lining of the gut and they actually start to harm it. And they don't break the food down in the way we want to and they make a bunch of toxins and they don't support and repair the lining and they don't protect the inside of our body from the outside. They actually do the opposite, they harm it. And that's where you start to break down the actual lining of the intestines. There's this, it's called the, um, the, um, the membrane is a single layer membrane called the, the mucosal surface of the gut. And it's just a single cell thick, so it's kind of fragile. And when that breaks apart and gets inflamed, 
all that barrier function is gone. And then things can start to leak into the bloodstream like toxins and incompletely digested food that aren't supposed to be there. And of course that can, in, an, in its own right, generate a lot of symptoms in the gut, like bloat, discomfort, pain, loose stool, incomplete stool, diarrhea, constipation, um, heartburn. I mean, and the list goes on and on. But systemically, you can also start to create disturbance because remember how we talked about the immune system's interface in, in being cued into the gut. So the immune system starts to get dysregulated and starts to mount an inflammatory hostile response, whether that's to toxins from microbes or medications, or it's from the actual incompletely digested food, or just, you know, that, that kind of inter, interplay with the foods we're eating. Um, and that's, that's a big, you know, big process that I think is, you know, just a huge driver of disease and, and disturbance in health with people is the degree to which this process is going on. And the confusing part of it, is it like it being manifested in all sorts of different ways? It's not just digestive symptoms, it's headaches, it's joint pain, it's um, difficult menstrual periods, it's anxiety, it's um, allergies, it's congested sinuses, it's getting frequent colds and flus. I mean, there's so many things that this disrupted process can precipitate, okay? So in essence though, that's one of the big scenarios that gets developed. And that's ultimately not only driving all this inflammation and immune dysregulation, but it's also curtailing the utilization and uptake of both macronutrients, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, as well as micronutrients, as well as minerals and vitamins, like all these constituents we need to keep ourselves healthy. Um, so, so that, that in, in essence is why digestive health is such a big focus to me because it has such a wide sweeping impact. And this is physiologically at the level of what's happening, what I suspect to be going on. And now we have some tests that we can validate that. I have some specialized stool testing I can run. I can look at map out people's bugs in their gut. We can look at functionality of the of the digestive juices. We can look at the, the lining and how healthy the lining is. Um, so, so fun ways to kind of get, to, get at that, but I also can perceive that by having a good clinical discussion and taking a good history. Um, and of course, most of the time, this process of kind of um, compromise to the intestinal lining and the digestive system happens slowly. It's rare that it's sudden and dramatic, although that does happen, like I mentioned, parasite infections, a big dose of a medication, et cetera, et cetera, um, like, a back, like an antibiotic can precipitate some of that. But more, more commonly, it's chronically eating foods that are unfriendly to your system, or it's being chronically stressed, or in my opinion, <laughs> what I see the most is a combination of being chronically stressed and eating foods that are unfriendly to our system. Okay, so we are going to focus, oh, and by the way, one of the big things that happens when you're chronically stressed is you don't make enzymes. Your pancreas and your liver, gallbladder, and your stomach don't secrete the acid and the enzymes that are required to digest food, and then it sits and ferments and putrefies in the gut and causes all those same issues we were talking about earlier, okay? Um, <clears throat> whether that's, again, in the small intestine or the large intestine. That's, again, our focus area is that the action area of this going on is the small and large intestine, where that leakiness to the lining happens and all of those problems emerge. Okay, so now let's launch into the food allergy and intolerance. First, we need to define terms, and that's where this conversation we had is really relevant for me about digestive physiology. Because, in my opinion, food allergies and food intolerances are very different things. A food intolerance, generally speaking, is something that is long-term and is most of the time innate, meaning that it's something that'll always be true. Um, but on certain occasions, it's also something that's acquired. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute, the differentiation between 
an acquired food intolerance and an innate food intolerance when we, when we talk this all through. Um, generally, food intolerances are not severe, sudden reactions to foods. They're more cumulative and subtle. <clears throat> Um, but they often will be more like immediate, like you might, you know, eat um, a bowl of ice cream and immediately get, you know, mucus in your sinuses and throat, or you might, you know, eat a piece of wheat bread and immediately get a stomach ache or a headache. So that happens even with intolerances. Um, but a lot of times it's more chronic. It's like um, you eat wheat every day and it's not that each time you eat wheat, your joints get achy. It's just your joints are kind of always achy and are gradually getting worse. And you just have arthritis all the time now. Um, so there, there's this concept that they are, the mechanism of how the immune system gets tripped up by those foods with, with intolerances generally is a little more subtle and a little more cumulative. And, and again, lots of times, the intolerance to a food is innate, meaning it's, it's always going to be true, which is hard for some people to hear. Um, but I strongly feel as a you know, clinician that this is super true, that all of us have some foods we're just always going to be intolerant to, no matter how healthy our gut is. Whereas some of the intolerances, I think, can be resolved when we get our gut healthy, when we deal with those leaky guts, when we deal with the bacteria there, the, the microbiome, when we deal with the enzymes and the stress and all of that and improve all that, we can have more breadth of what our body assimilates well. Okay, so that's a food intolerance. Um, a food allergy is, to me, a much narrower definition. It is an acute phase reaction to a food. Um, so allergies are technically on a, on a biochemical level. I, I would really narrow that in to be saying that they're, this, they're called IgE mediated reactions in the immune system, which means antibodies, these little molecules that bind up various substances either in the gut or in the bloodstream and they marshal a bunch of immune cells to come destroy it and clear it. Um, it happens to be histamine and um, there are various types of macrophages and um, there are certain types of white blood cells that come in particularly relate to that allergy response tends to be that those responses are much more sudden and severe. This is where we talk about like a peanut allergy where your throat could constrict and close off or um, an allergy to wheat where you get hives immediately if you eat wheat within minutes. And that is more classically an allergy to food and it's IgE antibody mediated. Um, that scenario is something is really the only type of quote unquote food related issues conventional medicine considers when they when they kind of like explore the role that food may play in causing health concerns <clears throat> which i feel is woefully inadequate because i think the vast majority of ways foods are disruptive have much more to do with these intolerances that we'll get into more depth about, okay? And the way that conventional medicine measures these allergies, besides the obvious acute phase reactions that will often happen, is they will also measure these IgE antibodies specific to different foods. And you can do that via blood or finger scratch or, or um, skin scratch and, and like, you know, test some of those antigens against the antibodies in the blood. Um, and then the idea there that they tell you is you just avoid those foods for the rest of your life um, because in their minds that they are not reversible. Um, I also will say that in my opinion, all food allergies are reversible. I mean, they're probably an extreme exception to that, rare, but the idea with allergies is we've actually acquired them during our life. And my suspicion of how we've acquired them is this same underlying pathophysiology 
at the gut level that we are either stressed, taking a bunch of antibiotics and steroids or drugs, we're getting infections of microorganisms, we're eating really constantly poor quality food and a lot of intolerant foods, and we mess up our gut lining so much that all of this undigested food starts leaking into the bloodstream and our immune system freaks out and sees it as something really hostile. And it, it mounts that IgE immediate antibody allergy response. And so what I will tell my patients who come in with allergy diagnoses is that um, this is reversible, this is curable, but in order to do that, we're gonna have to go about a long involved process of healing and repairing your gut. And once that has happened, then we can probably hopefully safely reintroduce these foods um, and, and have them be consumed without problem. And that is, um, you know, that is, I've seen that happen many a time in my practice. So that's what we talk about when we're talking about food allergies, which again, my opinion is a very small percentage of what we deal with in terms of food relationship to gut and health. The much bigger one is these food intolerances. And those intolerances um, can be assessed and measured in many different ways. Um, one of the ways that I would just say blanketly, and I'll be real honest, is there's a few foods that cause an immune, hostile immune reaction, and also really like tweak our microbiome in a, in a bringing on those like opportunistic microbe way really aggressively. Um, and the first and foremost of that is modern wheat, specifically the gluten content of modern wheat, which is highly immunoreactive glutinous, is increased thousands of fold from our ancestral types of wheat that humans evolved to be able to consume. So I really think just universally, people um, will harm their gut and are intolerant to conventional wheat. And so I advise pretty much everybody to minimize their modern wheat consumption that's been hybridized, right, and mutated and focus in if they want to consume wheat products on ancient grains like spelt and Ezekiel and einkorn. And those are readily available at health food stores. Another food that I see not universally, but very, very, very commonly um, as an intolerance is cow dairy. It's another situation where there's a lot of caveats, but most people consume cow dairy from an inorganic, um, modern, modernly produced milk source that in pretty high quantities that from the milk of cows, which is something that humans have not co-evolved with for very long, only a few hundred years. We did have a much longer co-evolution with goat and sheep milk and milk products. And that generally is much more digestible and tolerated by humans. Um, but cow dairy, we, we're not really equipped to digest. It's a very, the molecule of the protein in cow dairy is crazy large and like complex to break down. And so unless you have a super, super healthy gut and your system designed to digest it, which I don't think many people are, it also precipitates gut disturbance and is a, is a, tends to be something that is intolerant for a lot of people. So I'll just put those generalizations out there. Um, <laughs> And you'll see that my methodologies tend to really push people away from those foods. Now, I will make one caveat with dairy that generally really well fermented cow dairy, like 24 hour ferments that haven't been pasteurized. If you make your own yogurt from raw milk, or if you buy the Bulgarian yogurt at the health food store, they have them around here, it's called Bulgarian yogurt in a glass jar. That tends to be largely tolerated because of how it's pre-digested by the microbes in making the yogurt. Um, okay, so, but then we have to get into, well, what about all the other intolerances and the individuality of intolerances? Um, you know, how do we go about determining that? 
And so there's lots of ways to skin a cat, as they say, and every naturopathic doctor will probably have their own two cents about how they determine this. And I have my own as well, which I'll share with you. So the, the way that I see a lot of my colleagues working is it's also using an antibody test, but instead of an IgE antibody, we look at IgG and IgA antibodies. So IgG and IgA antibodies, two specific foods, I should say, are very common and they're much more slow building in their immune reaction. So that's remember how I told you like a lot of food intolerances are slower and more cumulative. Well, that fits these types of immunoglobulin reactions. And just like the IgE testing, you can poke a finger and send off a sample or draw blood out of the arm. And you can actually test if you are making antibodies to specific foods in high quantities. Now, what that test does and doesn't tell me is this. It's really only gonna tell me about what you are intolerant to that you are eating currently in your diet because things that haven't been in your diet for more than two months, you're not gonna have these kind of antibodies for. IgE is different. Those antibodies usually stick around a lot longer. So that's one thing. Number two, we have to caveat and consider what comes up positive with those IgG and A antibodies in terms of the health of the gut lining. What I find a lot is the leakier the gut lining, the more IgG reactions show up, which on one hand leads me to believe that these are intolerances that are more acquired versus innate or always true, because if you're having these IgG antibodies and all over the place, what you're really saying is you're incompletely digesting all your food and your big leaky gut is leaking all these food particles into the bloodstream and it's causing an immune reaction. So when I see those reports come back, because I do run this sometimes, I say, ah, we're dealing with a really leaky gut and partly we need to avoid some of these foods, but even more importantly, we need to repair your gut and all that goes into that which again is a little beyond today's scope. But one of the simple ways practitioners use these reports is they say, okay, anything with a, a strong reaction on that scale of antibodies, according to this blood test, remove from your diet for a few months, all your symptoms should get better. And then hopefully you can carefully reintroduce them and you won't have issues. And that happens for some people really well. I use this test more when my other methodologies are not improving cases, then I might jump in and say, I'm missing something. Maybe you're reacting to something I'm, I'm not aware of, okay? I, I forgot, I should have started with another methodology, which I call the gold standard. It is called elimination challenge. So very simply put, food intolerances, like I said, they are slow building often. So to really build up in your system, it takes a few weeks. And to really clear them out of your system, it also takes a few weeks. So if you really wanna learn if a food is causing inflammation or harm to your health or is, is not working for you, you can't just not eat it for a day and then eat it the next day and say, oh, it didn't cause problems. Um, the metaphor I use is like, hey, like if you're eating a lot of, if you're eating a food that you're intolerant to constantly, you're going 80 miles an hour on the freeway and each time you eat it, you're speeding up to 81 miles an hour. You're just already real inflamed from that inflammation response that a little bit more of that substance is not gonna you know, change your perception of things. Whereas if you clear that food from your system over the course of four to six weeks, then you're getting on the freeway and you're going from zero to 81. And you're really gonna notice that change. So that's what's required of elimination challenge. I say about six weeks off of food and then reintroduce it. And you know, a few tablespoons is sufficient, but I would do a nice big dose of it and see if you notice any symptoms, again, which can be digestive, headaches, fatigue, runny nose, I mean, on and on and on, right? We kind of talked through some of those and that's again, beyond today's scope to talk about how to monitor that. But usually, presumably it's a, it's a pattern that you'll notice relatively quickly. It might not happen instantly from when you eat the food, but it might be within a few hours. 
um, especially digestive symptoms are usually within a few hours um, or at least within a day. You know, you might wake up fatigued or with a headache the next day. You'll no notice. Now you can do a more aggressive elimination challenge, which I often encourage in the form of a detox. And I have a, a fall and a spring program where we as a group move through this methodical process to remove inflammatory foods completely from our diet and do actually a modified fast for the equivalent of eight days. And then we methodically reintroduce foods. The cool thing about that is I actually believe that it's such an aggressive clearing of toxicity, that this, this particular detox, that that inflammation from those foods, instead of taking four to six weeks, can be gone pretty much in a week. And therefore, when you start to methodically reintroduce foods, you can identify food intolerances. Now, we don't necessarily know if they're permanent intolerances versus acquired. That's more to do with the longer term learning process with your gut of, can you eventually reintroduce these foods when your gut's healthy? Um, but that is, that is the gold standard method to determine food intolerances. It works great. However, very few people have the bandwidth and, and willpower to abstain from foods for long periods or to do these intensive detoxes. So I don't get a lot of takers or people coming in like, you know, wanting to or being willing to do that. But it's ultimately, I think, the best tool for this discernment process. Okay. There's a few other tools that I want to mention. There's a, there's a realm of tools that has to do with I would call it not reproducible science, which is like the bias of the practitioner or the medium that is, you know, determining the intolerances is not reproducible. And those methods are muscle testing and something called radionics or Carroll intolerance testing, which was pioneered by a doctor in Spokane a hundred years ago and is to continue to be used in our region by some practitioners in nature pests. Um, and various electrical um, tools, Vega machine is one of them, but certain electrical tools that'll pass um, current through a food that you're holding to determine if you're reactive to it. So I don't use those. I don't dismiss the, the, the tool itself. I think as a practitioner, you need a ton of training to get consistent and helpful results with that. So um, that's another methodology people use to determine these sensitivities or the intolerances. And then um, there's of course, just like this whole concept of fads of different diets, like you know, keto diet says carbs are bad and autoimmune diet says tomatoes and nightshades and wheat and potatoes and dairy and like all of these foods are, make things worse. Um, and you know, the diet, the kind of one size fits all diets go on and on and on. There's many of them. One that I use quite a bit is a gut healing diet called GAPS, which removes fermentable carbohydrates. So if we're talking about an obvious question might be, well, how do you heal the gut? If the, you know, compromised gut is what makes these intolerances and health conditions so much worse, I have found that pro protocol to be very helpful. GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome. And, um, and there's lots of resources online and I teach patients about it and we use it sometimes. Um, what lastly, but importantly, what I will talk about is the blood type based nutrition guidance in the blood type as a tool for discerning food intolerances. And the principle of that is based on genetics. It's based on the idea that our blood groups make our immune systems have certain behaviors according to certain foods. The science of this concept goes but way back over hundred years. And there's, there's immunology research to show that in test tubes, when you introduce certain foods in, into a particular type of secretion or blood that based on blood type, the immune system will have various reactivity. So for example, lentils will have a friendly um, response to the immune system of an A blood, A blood type 
but will have a hostile response to the immune system of a B blood type. Right. Um, tomatoes will have a friendly response to the immune system of an O blood type, but a hostile response to the immune system of an A blood type. And so that specific interaction is mediated by something called lectins. And lectins are compounds that live on um, every food individually that are more immunoreactive. And so the idea is that according to each blood type, certain lectin expressions are hostile or friendly to the blood group derived immune, immune interface. Um, that's where we're dealing with this concept. And again, it's scientific. And I will say as a clinician, it's been really effective for me. Um, so when we utilize that information, you're hearing genetics and blood type, you can't change that, right? So I would also argue that this is one of those intolerances that is lifelong, right? It's permanent and always true. Um, another thing really, really important to say about intolerances is that I find them to be dose and frequency dependent. So let's say an A blood type has trouble digesting potatoes and you love, love, love potatoes and potatoes are always served and you go to social gatherings, all that. And that would be pretty devastating to say, I can never eat a potato because I'm intolerant to it and I always will be. Well, it's not quite that cut and dry because if the re reaction is dose and frequency dependent, theoretically having a little potato here or there in small amounts or infrequently will not precipitate such a huge immune disturbing response. And so for a lot of people, they find, hey, if I do this about 80% of the time, my system is pretty dang well in balance and I've experienced pretty minimal symptoms. Um, so when you consider approaching a dietary element, you know, have that practicality aware with, you know, sense it for with intolerances being dose and frequency dependent. For some people who are really sick, you might need to totally avoid it for a long time to really get your gut healed and really get the inflammation down. Um, but for others, you might be able to just reduce your exposure and have symptom improvement in gut health rebalancing, right? So that blood group information um, I've used for a long, long time. I find it to be a very practical, approachable thing for my patients. It's not overwhelming. And even though the different blood groups have different guidance, I think that broadly speaking, you can intersperse those with different family members without it being overwhelming. And one criticism that is made about this, there's several criticisms, which I won't go into, but one criticism that I love to answer is, well, it just seems like the blood type diet's a healthy diet in general, no matter what the blood type. And if that's the criticism, then great. If I'm getting people to eat a healthier diet and they're you know, trusting in that and they're feeling better, then if it's simply that, that's fine with me. Um, Ultimately, I tell patients, don't take my word for it. If you really want to, you know, assess these, you know, um, hypotheses for yourself, then if you're an A blood type and it says you're intolerant to beef, stop eating beef for four to six weeks and then have a big steak and see how you feel. Um, almost universally, people will say, wow, that sat like a rock in my stomach or I got heartburn or I couldn't, I slept poorly that night, right? So you can get a very good barometer and gauge of these relationships by doing an elimination challenge, working off the blood type principles. Um, there is a further evolved, refined version of this called genotyping, which is taking the blood type, but also amalgamating other genes, including secretor status, and also including a comprehensive set of individual biometric measurements, personal and family and laboratory health history. So it's just like all of this super duper individualized assessment in, in like making a much more precise gauge of, you know, intolerances and, and optimizing foods. So that genotyping process we do at the clinic for established patients, it runs, I think like, 350 bucks, but it's information that never changes for the rest of your life. So I think that's pretty cool. 
and mostly my really like already established patients who are really serious about their health journey and truly want to invest heavily in food as medicine are, are, are great candidates to do that process. Of course, anybody really sick is too, but you know, get all this information and not use it, then, you know, why would you invest in it? So the, that is kind of a big overview inventorying of how I look to go about understanding food intolerances and allergies. And then, you know, last but not least, the question is, what do I do about that? So I've, I've made the argument that, you know, these food as al allergies and intolerances can be really detrimental to health if we're constantly consuming those foods on a regular basis. So if that's a motivation to alleviate symptoms or to I, improve vitality or longevity, it's one of the single most best things you can work on and have free will in changing. We'll also caveat in a big way that most of our relationships with food are very habituated and very emotionally intertwined in how we cope with life. So I'm not as naive as to think that, oh, I simply tell you this is what's best for you and you're gonna go do it because you'll feel better. That actually, I mean, somewhat sadly rarely happens. What's more common is, you know, someone might start and revert back to old habits or they might make gradual change or they might not make any changes. And that's totally their choice. I'm very accepting of each person's journey being their, their journey. Um, and sometimes we really have to get into the like questioning the, the pattern and the psychology and the relationship with food aspect of what, what is inhibiting you from choosing what is most nourishing and, and not hurtful to your body. So um, that's a very intimate conversation that can happen a lot as many of you on the call maybe have had with me. Um, I have been in that conversation with myself for a long time in my life and continue that conversation. Um, and I, I'm very graceful with it being a journey and an evolving process, but I'm also grateful for what I've learned and how it's contributed to my health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And I'm honored that I get to do that with such a knowledge basis with my patients as well, because I've also seen it really transform their life and their health. Um, so I think I see the clock striking too. I'm going to wrap up here. I hope you all have learned some nice little tidbits from this chat. Um, welcome and open to questions fired my way through the clinic email or the portal if you're a patient. Um, I'll respond to them at some point. No, no promises of quick turnaround, but um, yeah. And if you want to chat more on an individual basis about any and all of this, then schedule some time with me. My, my schedule's booked pretty far out right now, um, but that would be great um, to chat more. So thank you all. And um, if there's no questions, which I have not seen through the whole time, then I will um, break it here. Okay, thanks everyone.